We come this evening to a consideration of the last verse, namely the 25th verse in the 7th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I say we come to this because we have been attempting to deal with the previous verses in this most extraordinary, remarkable, and in many respects complex statement. And uh, we fail to deal with this particular verse in detail last Friday evening. Now, uh, we nevertheless need not spend much time with this uh, particular verse. You notice that it's divided into two sections. The first section, I thank God uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, that I have been describing, as you will remember, as a kind of ejaculation. Uh, the apostle suddenly is carried away by what Charles Hodge describes so rightly as a strong and sudden emotion of gratitude. And as is his custom, he expresses it. We've had many occasions to observe and to emphasize the fact that the great apostle was not over punctilious in the matter of style. Uh, he was a man who was free and who enjoyed the freedom of the spirit, not a mere writer, not a mere literary man, not concerned uh, primarily to produce some masterpiece of literature. He was much more concerned about what he said than the way in which he said it. Uh, we can be quite sure of that, that the apostle never cultivated art for art's sake, never attempted eloquence for the sake of eloquence. And he proves that by these anachalusa, so-called, these uh, interruptions. And he does it also uh, very frequently by bursting forth into praise or into thanksgiving. He finds it difficult always, uh, one gathers, uh, to mention the name of our Lord without uttering some kind of apostrophe. He interrupts what he's saying for the moment, but he's just carried away uh, by the strength and the depth of his uh, deep emotions. And... Uh, here, it seems to me, there can be no question at all as to the fact that that is what he is doing. He interrupts what he is saying. And, of course, the interruption came in this way. This is the kind of thing he had been saying. I delight in the law of God after the inward men, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he couldn't restrain himself. I thank God, he says, he knows, through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is then, I say, a kind of sudden outburst, an ejaculation, not an essential part of what he's arguing and what he's saying. Indeed, I think we can prove that quite simply by looking now immediately at the rest of the verse, where he goes on to say so then. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. How does this prove it? Well, it proves it in this way, that if the expression, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, is an essential part of the statement and the argument, it works out like this, that he is saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what? Well, for the fact that I myself, with my mind, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now that is something surely that the apostle uh, could never say. Uh, Charles Hodge, uh, of course, is, is so absolutely right at this point. He says that that would be a most unnatural combination of statements. Yes, and that is a very striking understatement on the part of Charles Hodge. It would not only be unnatural, an unnatural combination, it is an impossible combination, it seems to me. Because if you take them as being directly connected like this, well, you pass from this thanksgiving to God in the name of Jesus Christ for the fact that you are in this condition that he proceeds to describe. Surely the thing is something which is quite impossible. The only uh, commentator, as far as I'm aware, who attempts to say that that is the order, I'm truly sorry to have to say, is Robert Holden, 
He's quite consistent with himself right through. As I've suggested all along, he really went wrong in the second verse of chapter 6. And therefore he's got to be consistent ever since. He interprets who shall deliver me in verse 24 as referring entirely to the future. So what he says, the apostle is saying here at the beginning of verse 25 is this. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord that I shall be delivered. Not that I know any deliverance now, but that when I come to die, he really does say that, I shall be delivered, not in this world, but in the next. So, you see, he therefore maintains some kind of connection. But it does seem to me that this is indeed uh, quite an impossible interpretation of these statements. Very well. The uh, so then, in the second statement, is nothing uh, but a summing up of what the apostle had previously been saying. And it is a very perfect summing up of what he has been saying, in a sense, from verse 14 onwards. He's back again, making another statement about this duality. This is then, he says, what it amounts to. That with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It's the old duality that he's already been telling us about. There is only one difficulty. It's not a vital one. It's more or less a mechanical one in the matter of interpretation here with regard to this I myself. Uh, He uh, undoubtedly is referring to himself, the person. But this is the problem. Does the I myself govern both the statements? or the two parts of the one general statement. In other words, is he saying this? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, I myself serve the law of sin. And it seems to me that in the light of verse 23, we really must say that. It isn't one of those vital points, but it is a point of which we've got to look at. We can't decide it for certain. Nobody can be sure of this. You may say, if you prefer it, that he's identifying himself as he wants to do with the mind. He says, that's the real I now. That is the possible interpretation. That he's saying, I myself, uh, my real desire and will is to identify myself with the mind. But I find this other law in my members. And so, I've got to admit it, that I serve the law of sin also. In other words, he is not disclaiming responsibility, as we saw before. It is an unchristian thing to do that. It is he who sins, and not only his flesh. He has told us, I know, in these curious statements, it is not I, but sin that dwelleth in me. Well, then, we have seen the explanation of that. He, as a person, is responsible for everything he does. But he is aware of these two me's within him that we saw in verse 18. Very well, then. Notice that the word he uses is the word serve. And that word means slave, to be a slave to, or a slave of. We saw that word, you remember, repeatedly in chapter 6. For instance, take verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants, now that means slave every time, His slaves ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God be thanked ye were the slaves of sin. And here he uses the same word. So he is saying, with the mind, I myself am a slave to, or slave it to, the law of God. But with the flesh, I slave the law, I'm a slave to the law of sin. He cannot say, therefore, that he is only the slave of the law of God, because he finds also that he is a slave of the law of sin because of his flesh. That is his old trouble. That's the thing that he's been telling us so frequently. Now, uh, a question, of course, arises here at once, which we shall have to consider when we come to, to our summing up. Whether it is possible for the fully regenerate men to make this statement in the light of what he has said in chapter 6 in verse 17, where he said this, But God be thanked 
that you were the slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now, there he is suggesting so strongly that they are no longer slaves of sin. They finished with it. Indeed, he goes on in the next verse to say, being then made free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. No longer the slaves of sin, but now the slaves of righteousness. However, we shall come to consider that in a moment in greater detail. Well, now then, that brings us to the end of our detailed verse-by-verse consideration of this most uh, interesting, this uh, well-known and difficult passage, which starts at verse 14 and runs on like this to the end of this chapter. Now then, let us have a look at this. First of all, let us try to have clear in our mind what the Apostle is saying. I mean by that, leaving out the details. What is the big statement he is making about this man, whoever or whatever the man is, from verse 14 to the end of the chapter? Well, we've seen very clearly, I think, the following. He is a man who is conscious of a duality within himself. There's no question about that. He says it many times. He is a man who has come to see that the law of God is spiritual, that it is good. Indeed, he delights in it. But, and here is the problem, he cannot keep it. He cannot keep it positively, he cannot keep it negatively. He wants to do the things that it commands, but he finds he cannot. He doesn't want to do the things that it prohibits, but he finds he does them. Now then, there is no question about these statements, is there? He sees clearly the character of the law, but he cannot keep it. Why not? Well, he says he cannot keep it because the law of sin which is in his members is too strong for him. That's the big statement. Now, he has stated that quite clearly in three verses at any rate. It's in verse 17. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This power of sin within him is stronger than himself, so much so that he can make that kind of statement. It is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. In verse 20 again. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin is too strong for him. It beats him. But of course it is still more explicit in verse 23. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. He himself is being brought into captivity to the law of sin which is in his members. Now, that's, these statements have only one meaning, and that is that the law of sin that is in his members, this indwelling sin, is too strong for him. It's too much for him. It brings him into a state of captivity. And, of course, the final proof of that is the cry in verse 24. It is as bad as that that he is a wretched man. And he cries out, saying, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And finally, you see, he sums it up in this last phrase in verse 25. Here, then, is what it amounts to. So then, this is it. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And therefore there is only one conclusion that he can come to about himself. It is the, conclu- the conclusion that he made at the beginning of the whole section, which is this. I am carnal, sold under sin. In other words, the business of verses 5 to 25 is to expound that statement as so often with this apostle and with many other and another new, uh, new Testament and even Old Testament writer, he starts with his conclusion and then proves it and demonstrates it. So he had told us the whole thing at the beginning. I am carnal, sold under sin. That's the only conclusion at which this man can arrive about himself. Not only is there this duality within him, but he is made captive to the law of sin 
which is in his members. It is stronger than his. It is defeating him. And he cries out, O oh, wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now then, there is the essential statement which is made in this most fascinating uh, paragraph. Are we now in a position to decide and to arrive at a verdict as to who exactly the apostle is describing? Well, I think one thing we can say without any difficulty or any hesitation. We have said it so often in working through the individual verses. This cannot possibly be the unregenerate man. His positive statements about his delighting in the law, the loving of the law, seeing the spiritual character of the law, make it impossible. You cannot reconcile it if that is the case with what he's already told us in verses 7 to 13, where he tells us that he didn't understand the law. That was his trouble. He was alive apart from the law once. He thought all was well because he hadn't seen it. When the commandment came, ah, yes, well, now... The man he's talking about here is a man to whom the commandment has come. That's why he sees it spiritual and good, and that is why he delights in it. In other, in not only that, but we've seen also that the unregenerate man is incapable of recognizing this duality and uh, of conceiving of himself in this spiritual, psychological manner, which we have seen to be characteristic of this particular section. Very well. I think we need spend no more time in considering the case that the apostle here is describing an unregenerate man. So we are left with this question, the next question that comes before us. Is this then a description of the fully regenerate man? Is it true to say that the apostle Paul here was writing about himself, and writing about himself as he was at the time when he wrote the epistle to the Romans? You remember their argument about the present tense. Now then, this is the next position that we've got to consider. Is this a description of the regenerate man at his best in this life and in this world? Is it right to say that the regenerate man is always like this and that he never rises beyond this? That it is indeed the Apostle Paul writing about himself at the height of his experience as an apostle of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now then, what is the next step? Well, there is a very good rule when you're dealing with a difficult passage of Scripture such as this, which one should never fail to put into operation. And the rule is this. Don't be too anxious to arrive at a decision merely on the evidence that is before you. If ever you have a difficult passage of Scripture, then the first thing you should ask yourself is this. Are there similar passages somewhere else in the Scripture? Can I, I wonder, find any light on this problem that is confronting me by referring to other parts of the Scripture? Other parts of Scripture written by this same apostle? other parts of Scripture written by other scriptural writers. There is no better rule than that, comparing Scripture with Scripture. And when you've got a difficult passage, this should be an absolute rule without any variations or exceptions whatsoever. Most heresies in the history of the Church have come into being because people have founded a whole doctrine on one verse or one section and have forgotten to consult other sections of Scripture which deal with the same pipe. Very well, then, let us observe the rule ourselves. So, we, our next step is this. There are certain passages of Scripture which it is argued to say exactly the same thing as the Apostle is saying here. Now then, if that is so, it is a very important argument. Because um, those who are not prepared to say that the Apostle is here describing himself say that this is a unique statement without any parallel anywhere in the Scripture. Now then, that is the immediate issue before us. Well, now let's look at some of these passages which, to which reference is made. And I suggest you can divide them into two groups. The first is this. 
There are passages which seem to be describing the same kind of struggle which is described by the apostle in the seventh of Romans. What are they? Well, I read one of them to you at the beginning, the one which is found in the epistle to the Galatians in chapter 5, a most important statement. Now, especially attention is drawn to verse 17. Let me read it to you. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, let's admit at once that a reading at first sight and on the surface, and in a cursory manner, one is tempted to say, well, of course, there is the very thing that the apostle has been saying in Romans 7. Here are these two sides. The flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary to the one to the other, as the law of the mind and the law in the members are contrary the one to the other. And what is the result? That you cannot do the things that you would. At first sight, it seems to be an exact parallel. But the moment... You look at it again, and especially the moment you read the context, I think you will find that the two statements are indeed almost entirely different. In what way? Well, you notice that the apostle introduces the statement in Galatians 5.17 by the statement in Galatians 5.60. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the deeds or the lust of the flesh. And I really feel there's no need to go any further. There is the apostle laying down a fundamental statement. If you walk in the, in, in the spirit, and I'm commending you to do it, you walk in the spirit, he says, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What he said in Romans 7 is that in spite of every resolution to keep the law of God, he becomes captive to the law of sin which is in his members. But not only that, you notice that there is a new factor in this passage in Galatians which is not present at all in Romans 7. What is that? The mention of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned in Romans 7. The whole point of this passage in Galatians 5 is to mention him. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the law or the lust of the flesh. Very well then, we see two uh, different points here. That the apostle's object in Galatians 5 is to show the way of victory. Not only to show it, but to guarantee it. Because of this other factor, the Holy Spirit who is within them, who is not mentioned in Romans 7. But there is a third point of difference. Go on to verse 18. Which at first seems a, an extraordinary statement. But he says... If you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now that, you see, is an exact repetition of what the Apostle says in Romans 6.14, which I have been emphasizing all along, is in a sense the key to the whole of Romans 7. Romans 7 is in a sense an exposition of Romans 6.14. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you are not under the law, but under grace. He's saying it in a different way here in Galatians 5.18. But if you be led with the Spirit, you are not under law. And don't think of yourselves like that. That's not your position. So there again, as in verse 16, he is showing not only the possibility of victory, but the certainty of victory to those who realize this truth about themselves. And then to add still further, there is the statement in verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. There's not a word about that in Romans 7. Not a word. 
But here he says that it is something that is true of all Christians. They who are Christ have done this. It's happened. They have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The whole trouble, I suggest, with the men in Romans 7 is that he can't do that. Hence his problem, that the flesh is too much for him, and he is being made captive all along, in general, to the law of sin which is in his members. Very well then. I think we are entitled to draw this conclusion. That Galatians 5, far from saying the same thing as Romans 7, is not only saying the exact opposite, but was designed to say the exact opposite. Romans 7 is here to show us the state of failure of this man, who is trying, as it were, to sanctify himself by the law. The whole point of Galatians 5 is to show us positively the success and the victory that attend the man who is sanctifying himself and dealing with the problem within himself by the Spirit. He is a man who is able to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. There is not a word about that in Romans 7. Very well, there is our first statement. Then uh, we look at another statement, which is found in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse 9 and chapter 27. Here the apostle says this. Let me read verse 26 as well. I therefore, he says, so run... He is describing men striving for mastery in a race. I therefore so run, he says, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now then, this is quoted because people feel that, again, he is describing this same conflict within himself as uh, he describes in Romans 7. Now, there is no question that the apostle was referring to himself and to his present experience when he wrote 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 27. But rarely can anybody argue for a moment that this is a parallel with Romans 7. What he says in Romans 7 is this. I delight in the law of God after the inward men, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. But in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I keep under my body. I'm not only able to keep it under, I do keep it under. I beat it black and blue. That's what he's saying. I pummel it. I punch it. I keep it under and bring it into subjection. Can't you see it's the exact opposite again of Romans 7? Because he does say, and we all want to say, that the man who is regenerate is not yet perfect, and he does have a war to fight. The mere fact that he says that he's got a war to fight doesn't mean that he is defeated, but in Romans 7 he is defeated. Here in 1 Corinthians 9, 27 he says, there is a battle, there is this tendency, sin is there, it's always ready to take an opportunity. But uh, I'm putting these words into the mouth of the apostle because this is really what he's saying. But he seems to say, as I have already stated in the sixth chapter of my epistle to the Romans in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You're in a position not to let it. You're in a position to keep it under. Keep it under. I myself do keep it under. I keep it in order. I am running this race, and I'm not going to be robbed of my prize. I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection. The man in Romans 7 would have given the whole world if only he could have said that. But he couldn't say it. That was his old trouble. That he was being brought into subjection by what? Well, by these, this law of sin that's in his members, in his body. In his members. It's the exact opposite, you see. 
There is one other passage that is sometimes quoted, and I refer to it, although I want to show you that really I don't think it applies at all. It's the passage, of course, at the end of the epistle to the Ephesians, in chapter 6, where he says, we res- in verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you see, they jump at the word wrestle. It sounds as if it's near Romans 7, the fight going on. But there are two answers to this. In this passage in Ephesians 6, he is not talking about the struggle with that which is in the flesh. He even says so. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not the essence of the problem he's considering. What he means is this. He says our essential problem, you know, in the last analysis is not sin within us. It is these evil forces, the devil and his cohorts, that are outside us. There's the battle. But you notice that he says even with respect to that, he says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can be strong, you can get a victory. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and defeat him. What would the man in Romans 7 give if he knew that and if he could say that? But he didn't know it. That was his whole trouble. No, it's no use quoting the struggle in Romans 6 because the whole point of that passage again is to show that it is possible for the regenerate man to be victorious and to stand, having done all things, to stand in the evil day. He's a conqueror. He is not defeated. Very well. Now, there are the passages that are so commonly quoted because they seem to suggest the same kind of struggle as is described in Romans 7. I trust that it's plain to all that the three passages are saying the exact opposite. But there are other passages. And this is the second group. Now we are going to look at some interesting passages which seem to be similar to the statement in Romans 7 because they speak about mourning and about groaning. Ah, they say, now then, here's the point. If you can find other statements in the Scripture which show that the fully regenerate man groans and mourns You've established that Romans 7 is about the fully regenerate men. Very well. Let's have, another, let's have a look at these passages. Where are they? Well, the first is in chapter 8 of this same epistle to the Romans. I've already read it to you. Let me read again the two crucial verses. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Here's the fully regenerate men. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. The second verse is verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings. The groanings are not in the Spirit, they're in us, which cannot be uttered. Isn't this the same? We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Oh, wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Absolute parallel, are they? To start with again, notice that in Romans 8, 23, there is this vital addition, which you haven't got in Romans 7. We who have the First fruits of the Spirit. Not a word about that is to be found in Romans 7. But the argument doesn't depend upon that. The answer to this suggestion is simply this. That in this section in Romans 8, the apostle is not considering the struggle which a man has with sin within himself. What is he considering? He is considering and discussing the struggle with sin in the world, sin in circumstances, sin in trials and troubles and tribulations that come to us in this life and in this world. Let me prove it to you. Go back to verse 17. 
If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Listen, if so be that we suffer with him, suffer with Christ. Well, that cannot mean suffering because of sin in the body, because he never did suffer from that. But here he's dealing with suffering with him, that we may be also glorified together. But we needn't wait at that. Listen to what he goes on to say. For he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings in which we find ourselves in this world, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And to make it doubly certain, he says this, for the earnest expectation of the creature, brute animal creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity. He means now the animals and flowers and everything that is in brute creation. For the creature was made subject to vanity, and not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. What is that? Is that the fight with indwelling sin? Do the animals and the flowers have to fight a fight against indwelling sin? Well, of course they don't. What do they have to fight? Oh, all they have to fight is this, nature read in truth and claw. The kind of agony of the cosmos. The struggle in the whole of life that has come in because when man sinned, God cursed the ground. The whole of life has become difficult. There is this struggle in the whole of nature and of creation. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. In other words, though the Christian is redeemed and regenerate, he is living in a world of sin. It's a world of sorrow, it's a world of pain, it's a world of suffering, it's a world of evil, ugliness, foulness, subject to illnesses and diseases. That's what he's talking about here. He is not even considering the problem which is dealt with in Romans 7. But how frequently is this missed? Simply because he said groaneth, you see. Ah, there's the wretched man again. There's not a bit of it. He's not talking about the same thing at all. I have a final proof to which I will bring you in a moment. But wait a minute. Let's be clear then that in Romans 8 he is dealing with an entirely different subject. All right, we're told. What about 2 Corinthians 5? Well, let's have a look at 2 Corinthians 5. Let me read it to you. Let me start at verse 2. For in this, this tabernacle, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so being that being clothed we shall not be found naked. And back again. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life, and so on. Now then, you see, the argument is that here again is this wretched man of Romans 7. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. What's my burden? Oh, the load of sin. Sin that is in my members, this thing that is leading me into captivity. Here is the fully regenerate man speaking, and it is the fully regenerate man. Yes, but we are told here he is groaning because of this burden of sin and longing for his glorification. What is the answer? Well, the answer is, of course, that here again the apostle is not speaking of the subject which he is dealing with in Romans 7, but is just putting once more what he puts in Romans 8, verse 18 forward. I can prove it. You needn't take my word for it. He begins the subject in the 7th verse of chapter 4 of Second Corinthians. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted. He's talking about things outside himself, not inside himself. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We which live are always delivered unto death, for Jesus' sake. This was the kind of life he was living. Death worketh in us, but life in you. 
All things are for your sakes, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward men perish, the inward men is renewed day by day. Our light affliction, these are the things outside us, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And to prove that they're outside, he says, while we look not at the things which are seen outside us, but the things which are not seen. And then first verse in chapter 5, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, if they kill us, if they martyr us, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's not the same problem at all. He is dealing there with the trials and the tribulations, the persecutions and the sufferings of Christian people because they were Christian. It is not the same problem, the same question at all as is dealt with in Romans 7. But I want to give you my final proof for saying this. If you are going to look for the word groaned in the scripture... And say every time you find a Christian man groaning or being burdened, it's of necessity describing the struggle against sin within. Well, then you'll find yourself saying that our Lord himself had a struggle against sin within. Let me give you the evidence. Isaiah reminds us in his 53rd chapter that when he comes, he will be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And when he came, he was. For I read in Mark 9:19 that when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and saw these people, these disciples arguing with the, with the men and his poor son who was having those terrible fits and the people all looking on, he looked at them and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? But I've got even stronger evidence. Look at him there that day outside the sepulcher of his friend Lazarus in John chapter 11. And listen to what he says in verse 30. uh, Listen to what we read in verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Indeed, I'm told in verse 25, Jesus wept. He was burdened. He groaned in the depth of his spirit. He was troubled in his spirit. And he wept. Look at him a short time later in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is what I find. And being in an agony. In an agony. And he proceeded to sweat drops of blood. Our Lord groaned in this world. In this tabernacle, says Paul, we do groan being burdened. Yes, and the Lord groaned in spirit for the same reason. Not because of sin in the members. No, no, but because this is a world of sin. Because of all that sin has done to this world. Why did he cry at the grave of Lazarus? Oh, it was his natural human sympathy, says somebody. Nonsense. He knew he was going to raise him in a moment. No, no. He was face to face with this horrible thing, death, that had come into the world as the result of sin and was going to lead to his own death and separation from the Father. That's the meaning of Jesus wept. That's why he groaned and was troubled in spirit, though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. He groaned because... He was here looking at sin in the world, sin objectively. And that's exactly what Paul is doing in Romans 8, 18 and forwards, and also in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5. Indeed, the apostle puts this quite explicitly in the epistle to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 24, where he says this, Who, speaking about himself, now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ, in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. There is exactly the same thing. He is filling up that which remains of the affliction of Christ in his own flesh, in his own body. 
He has entered into such intimate communion with his Lord and Savior that he really is feeling something of what Christ suffered when he was in this evil world. The sight of it all and the realization of it all that made him groan. In this tabernacle we do groan being burdened. Though we are saved and rejoicing in it, it nevertheless is a veil of tears. It's a land of woe. That's what he says in Romans 8, and that is what he says in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. So these statements, which because they have this idea of burden and trouble and tribulation and agony and groaning, which seem superficially to be saying what he says in Romans 7, I think we have seen clearly and conclusively, are not dealing with the subject at all that is dealt with in Romans 7, and therefore have no relevance whatsoever to this question of deciding as to who is the man described in Romans seven fourteen to 25. Alas, our time is gone. And I don't ask you for your verdict. Neither do I propose, as is done sometimes at the present time, to lock you up until you arrive at your verdict. But I propose rather that you go on considering this matter. We've got the evidence before us. We have looked at the passages which are said to be similar. God willing, next Friday night, we shall go on to see and to show that if the passage is interpreted like this about a fully regenerate man, that it is then incompatible with the teaching, the plain teaching of the apostle elsewhere with regard to the regenerate men. And after that we shall show that it is incompatible with teaching elsewhere in the scripture concerning the fully regenerate men. And having in that way dealt with that aspect of the matter, we shall still be left with this question. Is it then the description of an immature Christian, the Christian who has not yet gone on to receive the second blessing? That's a very much simpler question, and it won't take us long. So I trust that next Friday night, God willing, we shall be able to complete our consideration of this great section. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we come again into thy presence to thank thee and to bless and praise thy name for thy word. We see, O oh Lord, more and more clearly how, if we had not this word in its fullness, we would so easily go astray. We humbly thank thee, therefore, for ever having called thy servants, for having given them the revelation of the truth and the controlling power of thy Spirit as they have wrote it. We thank thee likewise for the gift of the Spirit to us. O Lord, receive our prayers. Bless us, we pray thee, as we meditate upon these things. Take us all and lead us upon our several ways. Grant us grace that wherever we are and whatever our circumstances, we may ever be able to be living witnesses to thee and to the power and the glory of thy grace. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this hour, short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and until we shall be safely in glory. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips.
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.